Chuck, great to see you again. Nice to see you. I I, I know I'm coming in hot here today, <laughs> but uh, that might make it all the more interesting. So yeah, you, you, you're such a good friend and uh, have been for a long time. And I'm just grateful for everything that you're doing at Active Town. So this is this is cool. I've been looking forward to this. Chuck, why don't we do this? Why don't we kick this off by giving you an opportunity to introduce yourself to the audience? Uh, my audience is a little bit different than uh, maybe your Strong Towns podcast audience. And uh, yeah, so uh, let me just turn the floor over to you for a real quick 30-second uh, introduction as to, as to who is Chuck. My name is Chuck Maroon. I'm a civil engineer. I'm a land use planner, and I'm one of the founders of an organization called Strong Towns. And Strong Towns, we do primarily through media, building a movement for change about how we build our cities. Uh, our core insight is that cities have grown financially uh, constrained, financially weak, financially fragile. And that is largely because of our development pattern, the way we actually build our cities creates more long-term liabilities than it creates in wealth and prosperity. And that insight aligns with so many other things. One of the things that aligns really well with is active living. Uh, what we have found is that when we have neighborhoods where people bike and walk, uh, those are also neighborhoods that are financially really successful for the people that live there, for the community at large. And so I think that's how you and I got intertwined. And yeah, you can find all of our stuff at strongtowns.org. We publish articles every day. We've got po many podcasts, a little bit of video. Uh, we don't do stuff as fancy as John's doing here, but uh, we, we do our best. <laughs> uh, yeah, we, uh, we do go back uh, quite a few years now. I'm trying to remember if it was, I think it must have been 2011. Um, I know for sure we were at the same CNU in 2012. And then, mm -hmm. of course, I, I did my great uh, Upper Midwest uh, Active Towns tour in 2013. So I got to visit you in, in Brainerd. And that was the first time that you and I were on a podcast together. I got to sit down in your uh, your old studio when you were in the other uh, building over by the yep. train tracks. So, yeah, yep. it's been a while. And you you have uh, you are you're one of the few people who remember my old house and uh, you were there. You've met my wife. You've met my kids. Uh, so yeah, you know, we, 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 we go way back and, uh, know each other very well. Yeah, so. we, we sure do. And let me uh, pop on over to the website here. Uh, yes, uh, strongtowns.org. Uh, and uh, I highly recommend that if you're not already a member of this organization, please consider doing so. Uh, you know, it's, you know, hey, five bucks a month, whatever you can afford, it's well worth it. You gain access to just a plethora of content. Uh, why don't you give your, your, your 30 second, you know, stump pitches to, you know, what makes Strong Towns different than maybe any other organization that might be out there. I appreciate that. From an from an advocacy standpoint, we do focus on changing the culture. I was I was at a conference last week and they were everybody got up and said, you know, we're trying to do this, but the culture won't last. We're trying to do this, but people get upset. We're trying to do, and we are focused really on changing the broad culture around growth and development. We've got five priority campaigns. Uh, incremental housing, safe streets, ending highway expansions, uh, transparent local accounting, and uh, reducing parking subsidies and require mandates. And all of these speak to things that uh, we can all do uh, in communities to make them better places to live, to make them stronger, to make them financially more successful. And so we, we focus on that. Uh, getting people in, getting this kind of broad message out. 70% of, we reached 2 million people in the last 12 months and 70% of them are non-technical, non-elected officials, non-decision makers. They're just, I just say just, they are people who care deeply about their place. And that's kind of our, our core audience. And that's, those are the heroes of our story. That's awesome. That's fantastic. I, I appreciate you doing that. And um, you you had mentioned that you've been on the road quite a bit. <laughs> it's like, it's been like three Insane. weeks, right? Yeah, no, it's been three weeks straight. I've actually, last night I slept in my own bed in my own home uh, for the, like, I think the third time in October. And it's what today, the 27th yeah. of October. <laughs> so yeah, fall is always a busy travel season for us because yeah. there's conferences and there's other things. And we we go where people are gathered and try to share our message and we get invited to speak in a lot of different places. I, I was in the UK 
a couple of weeks ago. Uh, that was a crazy, crazy experience. Um, delightful, wonderful, but like blew my mind. Uh, I spent some time in California, Wisconsin. So yeah, it, it's been, it's in a hectic travel season. And really, John, I've got a trip every week now between now and my wedding anniversary, which is December 16th. I get back okay. on the 15th in the yeah. last trip. And you and like to take time year. off, uh, you know, probably after December 16th, you're going to take a fair amount of time off because you like to kind of nestle in and, <laughs> and uh, get into the holidays. I always feel like you, you, you're in this marathon of 12 months. And if you can take the last couple of weeks of the year, I, I, I have been fortunate enough to build an organization uh, that uh, covers my rhythm of life. And so we shut down the last couple of weeks of the year. We're like, nobody's reading anyway. And we kind of decelerate a little bit and take that as a reflection time. So yeah, yeah. that's, that's what I do. What I'm looking, do. I'm looking forward to it, but it's a sprint between now and then, right? Yeah. We're in the home stretch. Yeah. Yeah. Well, and I, I do want to emphasize uh, to, to the folks, if you notice, I'm sort of looking off screen from time to time, I'm monitoring your chats coming in. And, and again, uh, shout out to everybody who's joining us here today. Uh, I want to start this off with a little bit of humor just to, you know, have some fun a little bit before we get into the serious stuff. Uh, and uh, our, our good friend Andy Baino uh, just uh, posted this out on Twitter, uh, uh, just not not too terribly long ago. I'm going to zoom in on this so everyone can see it. Uh, and, uh, it and basically, it, it says that, uh, yeah, every time the, the planning department asks for a traffic study, it gets worse. And we end up with, yet again, another crazy strode. <laughs> <laughs> that's exactly that's exactly right. Unfortunately, yeah, unfortunate, unfortunately. And the 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 second little bit of of uh, sort of uplifting humor is talking uh, about a a very important uh, topic that you just learned a, about recently, and that's the the, the concept of a strode taco. And so, yeah, there you go. We uh, <laughs> we, we, we had a, a tweet recently, uh, and uh, why don't you? Talk a little bit about the why that's hilarious. <laughs> <laughs> well, I I just love, and my comment was that, you know, young people always see so clearly, right? They always state the things. And it, it is a, you know, we, we invented the word strode here at Strong Towns. I, I never thought that I would have a word in the dictionary. The strode is this combination of a street and a road that that performs neither function very well. And it's a it's beautiful to see it escaping into the wild, right? It's not a it's not a technical term. It's not a term that we own. It's now general use, and it's it's broadly used. I, I did a search for strode the other day on Google and had millions and millions of of uses of it. You know, very few of those were us. It was a, you know this word that, like I said, has escaped into the wild. The idea that a child would not would would have this word as part of their lexicon and then apply it so cross brilliantly into another like genre like food critic yeah to me it was it was like the ultimate compliment yeah. right yeah. um it was the ultimate compliment because yeah, it, it, kids are so beautiful. Yeah, they really are. They really are. And uh, I'm going to uh, pop up a, a photo that's uh, well known to you because it's from your website. Uh, and, and, and this is kind of what we're talking about. We've got all of these streets that are out there that have been built to uh, essentially highway standards. You know, they're yeah. incredibly wide, encouraging fast speeds. And you, you have a little tagline that goes along with this. And what is that? Yeah. Well, if you need a sign to tell people to slow down, you designed your street wrong, right? It, interestingly about this shot, John, so right where this sign is, one block to what would be the right, looking at this to the north uh, as you're standing there, is my grandmother's house. My grandmother just is passed away in 1991, but that is the house where my mom grew up and where my grandma lived um, the entire, you know, my the entire time I knew her. If you go up two blocks from this sign, on the left is the elementary school where I went to. That's Lowell Elementary School. I went there. Incidentally, when I finished going there, I mean, my mom went there before me as well. When I finished going there, my dad was a teacher there. My dad retired, and then my daughters went there. So this, this particular street is one I'm very familiar with because I used to, once a week, walk over to my grandma's for, for lunch. And... 
you know, there's no traffic. It, it, there's no volume of traffic, but the road is designed like a highway and the traffic, little traffic that there is drives really, really, really fast. So yeah, it, it, this is a, this is a picture that I show because it's, I think everybody can relate to it to one degree or another. Everybody has this in their community somewhere, but this one is actually deeply intimate to me because I, I mean, it's, it's eight blocks that way from where I'm sitting. I know that like, this is my home. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. And, uh, uh, Nick, uh, you know, basically, uh, uh, says, yeah, like my city solution to speeders is new signs posted, uh, five miles lower than the one before. And again, yeah. signs, signs, and more signs. And yeah. in fact, you know, we, we, this is uh, something that, that I anticipated we might have a, a conversation, uh, that kind of heads in this direction. And uh, this is a photo of Hans Monderman as he's, uh, you know, out there removing signs. Uh, for those who may not know about Hans Monderman, uh, why don't you, you know, kind of uh, in introduce us all to uh, this brilliant uh, person uh, who is no longer with us. Uh, he has since passed. Yes. I, I never got to meet him. I just was a super fan and absolutely loved his work. So Hans Monderman, to me, is is most famous for saying, "When you treat people like idiots, they act like idiots." And when you when you recognize the truism of that quote, and then you step back and look at the transportation system that we built, we're we're all familiar with the dumb warning labels on everything. You know, we're, we're Americans, so, you know, lots of attorneys, lots of legalese. You get a commercial on TV in the last five seconds, is someone talking really fast, like that. And, and we're, we're used to that stupidity, right? But we have become passive. I think we don't recognize around us how our transportation system literally treats us like idiots. I mean, the, the, the sign pollution is one thing. But just everything about how we build assumes that humans are absolute morons who are completely incapable of making logical, basic decisions about life. And Hans Monderman, who was a, a Dutch engineer, recognized that humans are thoughtful, rational people, and that if we build environments that complement and, in a sense, play to our intelligence and our thoughtfulness, that almost everybody in the system acts thoughtfully and intelligently. And so he was all about removing signs. He was all about removing kind of the standard dummy things that we do, but replacing them with really thoughtful, good design that allowed people to do in an automobile, on a bike, walking, things that were very natural, but also slash very safe. Because the reality is like no human wants to get in a car crash. No human is like angling to kill somebody. Um, you know, I, yes, there are psychopaths among us, but they generally use other means. You know, the, the, the idea that uh, is emblematic of Hans Monderman is the idea that the human is a thoughtful species that will actually, given the opportunity, you know, perform very well. Yeah, yeah. And I, I can't bring up Hans without bringing ben up Hamilton, Dan Hamilton Bailey. Bailey. Yeah. yeah. So he yes. was uh, from London, the UK, and he yes. really picked up where Hans Monderman left off when it came to shared space and trying to reorient our brains to the fact that design matters. Yeah. Another apps. I, I did get to know Ben um, and Ben was like one degree of separation. Him and, and Hans Monderman were friends and this, and so by I, the way, I, this photo, by the way, I, I believe is from episode uh, 196 of the Strong Towns podcast. So you did have him on the podcast. Oh, yeah. I had him on a couple times and we we had oh, we had such beautiful conversations. It, it, the, the conversations were more beautiful even when we turned off the, the microphone and the, the cameras and everything and just talked. He, he was such a, a gentleman. He has also passed away such a gentleman, such a generous person. But I, I, I think the thing about him that was so stunning was that for him, a safe street design, and he focused a lot on intersections and how we handle, uh, in, in England, they would call them junctions, how we handle junctions, uh, how we handle intersections. It, it, he said it would only be safe if you could blindfold yourself and walk backwards into the intersection and feel completely safe doing it. And he 
practiced what he preached. He actually did that. He would blindfold himself and then walk slowly backwards through a block, you know, an intersection completely blind to the world. And he said, this is what safety looks like. It's a place where everybody is so aware and comfortable and understands what's going on that no one is going to hit you. No one's going to injure you. And the designs he did were, were genius. I mean, they were brilliant. Yeah. And I can't remember if it was, uh, if it was Ben Hamilton Bailey or Hans Monderman that channeled this meme, <laughs> you two lock spike. And, oh, uh, no, it was Ben. It was yeah, Ben. It was, yeah. ben. Well, I, I, it was Ben that handed it to, to me. Right. This is interesting because <laughs> he was a little, he, he was not sheepish about it because he was very firm in what he knew to be the right, what he knew it to be right. But he was, he did recognize that this was going to be a discomforting thought. But he said, you know, we, we, we do all this padding and armor for people within a motor vehicle. And he said, the reality is that, that that works great on the highway. That works great on the open road. But when people get into a city, what should happen is that their seatbelt should like automatically disconnect and come off. And a knife should come out of the center console because then that would create an, a symmetrical situation between people inside a vehicle and people outside of a vehicle. Because, of course, you know, if you get hit by a car, if you're walking, if you're biking and you're hit by a car, if that car is going over five miles an hour, you're, you know, even over like three miles an hour, you're going to suffer an injury of some sort. If it's over 15 miles an hour, that injury is likely to be traumatic. If it's over 22 miles an hour, that injury is likely to be fatal. And so what this signifies is in a sense like a symmetry, because what we want is we want the driver to be aware of, in a sense, uh, the mortality that they contain and likewise the mortality that other people contain. L let me say that in a different way because this wasn't a thing to say, oh, you know, like start seeing motorcycles, start seeing bicyclists, start being respectful. It was one of these things where if you get in a collision, it is going to have dramatic impacts for you. And this kind of goes to Adam Smith and some of his insights in the theory of moral sentiments, you know, he, he famously said, if, you know, a million people in China die tomorrow in a, a horrific earthquake or whatever, he said, that, that will be a note that I will, you know, take note of and, and maybe feel some sadness about, but, but quickly move on from it's a, it's a statistic. But if you told me that you were going to cut off part of my pinky tomorrow morning, I would not be able to sleep at night. I would be at a complete loss, even though like me losing my pinky is a tiny, tiny, tiny thing compared to a million people dying. It's very close to you. And so what that picture is meant to say is let's make this very close and intimate to the driver and then we'll get different behaviors from the driver. Yeah. I thought it was a brilliant insight. Yeah, it really is. Cause it kind of, it, it shakes us up. No, I don't want this in, in our automobiles, right. but it does yeah. talk, speak to the, the risk homeostasis, uh, you know, that, you know, as our driving systems, as our, our cars, you know, get safer and safer and safer, we feel as drivers more comfortable going faster and faster and faster. We feel as if there's not much vulnerability to us as drivers and therefore we become more aggressive as drivers. And this is going to be a little bit of a theme that kind of flows through some of the rest of what we're going to be talking about today is kind of a follow-up to a little activity that happened over on, on Twitter. <laughs> That's generous. <laughs> yeah, no, I mean, it, it was good because there's conversations that have to happen. And one of them, one of the, the, the con, uh, one of the conversations was around speed cameras. One of them was around uh, vilifying motorists and, and, uh, a, a I think a, qu uh, a query or a survey that you had uh, posted. And then gen in general, what has kind of popped up this month on Twitter for sure is a whole stream of uh, pedestrian education, safety education that comes off as victim blaming. And so those are the three main buckets that I'd like to uh, try to, uh, you know, 
cover here today. And we'll start off with what I'm labeling as the the uh, speed camera dust up. <laughs> and uh, that's I'll, fair. Yeah, yeah. I'll, 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 I'll put <laughs> this uh, this uh, this tweet up here, and uh, I'll let you kind of give a little bit of background and premise, since there's a lot of people t- uh, you know tuning in from the Netherlands and and other locations, uh, but. This was one of the, in the context of it, you're just sort of replying to the, this belief that we need speed cameras to try yeah. to, to, to do all of this. So, yeah, well, let, let's start with, and I do think that this is a little bit of the Ben Hamilton Bailey, the knife and the thing. Yeah. You're, you're recognizing that humans are human. Right. That they, I, I, I always feel like advocates sometimes believe that humans are not, you know, somehow human, like they don't have human characteristics and that we should either build better humans or get rid of bad humans. I, I think that this thinking goes in all kinds of horrible places. But if you look at this comment that the person said, drivers should be single mindedly focused on driving and like, oh, wouldn't that be delightful? Like I. When I give public talks, I will ask people, how many of you uh, in the audience, and this is hundreds of people often, uh, sometimes thousands of people, I'll say, how how many of you, when you're driving, feel comfortable listening to the radio? And like everybody in the audience does because everybody listens to the radio. We don't, in general practice, consider listening to the radio to be distracting or, or being reckless as a driver. How many of you feel comfortable singing along to the song? Well, John, I'm telling you that right now I could not have this conversation with you and sing along to a song because the human brain doesn't work that way. I'm engaged in our conversation. I'm incapable of listening to music and singing a song because I'm talking to you. If you're single mindedly focused on something, you cannot listen to a song. You cannot sing along. You cannot talk to someone in the passenger seat. You, you quite frankly, cannot read a billboard or a sign or a bumper sticker or, you know, a- anything else if you're single-mindedly focused. And I think we could say as an ideal, yeah, I mean, it would be great if humans were single-mindedly focused in their car. I think there's reasons why that's physically not possible. We can get into that, but let's just look at the practical reality there is 0% of drivers who are single-mindedly focused. And so if your standard is, if you're not single-mindedly focused, you are a reckless social deviant who's, you know, going to kill people. Um, that's a non-starter. That, 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 that doesn't recognize the reality of what driving is and what humans are. Right. Yeah. Yeah. And you, your, your retort to, to this particular uh, comment here is that, yeah, no, just slapping up municipal speed cameras uh, and saying and a sign that's, hey, speed cameras in use, that that's lazy. It's predatory. It's ineffective at actually changing the behavior because getting back to what we were talking about earlier, brilliantly you know positioned in terms of talking about street design, we've done nothing to change the street design. That's the most important thing that we need to start addressing. I, I think famous famously, there is a highway in Iowa, and I, I can't think of the exact one, but I mean, this was a decade ago. They put in, there was a speeding problem through this area. And I say problem, very the people were speeding through this area and they put up a speed camera and it basically changed the cash flow of this community because all of a sudden it was basically, it was a highway where a lot of out of town people were driving through. It wasn't primarily locals. It was primarily like uh, out of town people who were passing through and, um, you know, commuting or what have you and driving too fast. And they put up the speed camera and it just became a cash cow because it didn't, nothing about it addressed driver behavior. It's essentially like a speed, a classic speed trap. And, you know, you had the satisfaction of having a lot of money from it but you did not actually address the safety problem inherent with people speeding through that. And it was almost like there became this disincentive to deal with the safety problem because it would have impacted the revenue problem. And I'm, I'm not suggesting that as emblematic of all speed cameras. I don't think it is, but as an outlier, as like the far edge I feel like if you put that stake in the ground and you go, that is, that is not an appropriate use of speed cameras, 
there's lots of ways that you can use speed cameras appropriately, but if we can all agree that like that is an ineffective use of one, right. I think we can have a really good conversation about speed cameras. And we're going to get to what you're uh, describing as the credible speed camera program in just a second here. But really, when I saw this dust up happening and everything, I'm kind of thinking, you know, I can totally see that. If we have a situation, let's use a school as an example, an elementary school as an example. If we have gone through and created the design changes necessarily and even, you know, uh, done major traffic calming in that area, called it a school zone uh, with limited access even to the area. And and then we're still seeing deviant behavior, as you phrase it, truly deviant yep. behavior, then that's when we actually do this. And that's exactly what you said on the credible speed camera program is it's not that you hate speed cameras and think they're all a money grab. It's that we need to deploy them intelligently. Yeah, there's a certain like libertarian argument against speed cameras. And I think people like mesh me, they put me in that, they try to put me in that box and say, that's more, I don't, I, that's not my view at all. I love this approach. And I'm, I, I think this is my top tweet right now. So I just leave it there because I think it defines, can we talk about this idea of deviant behavior? Because I feel like this is really important. Well, I, I think it's, it's, it's also crucial to some of the other things that we, that ended up popping up, which is let's punish the driver. Because we right, have this impression right. that it's an us versus them and they're and that all drivers are, are, are therefore monsters. Yes, yes. And that is a that's a very strong set of beliefs among a certain group. And I, I think it also takes us in a wrong direction. So we've been doing these crash analysis studios at Strong Towns now all year. So we've done 10 of them. And for every single one, we send out these are places where there's been fatal crashes, traumatic injuries. We send the local group a speed camera and we have them go out and do a speed study. They actually, we train them on how to do this. They go out, they take the readings and they come back and say, here's uh, what the, the flow looks like in traffic. And in every single one, I think the lowest amount has been like 60% of people were speeding. And the highest one has been like 85 or 90% of people are going over the posted speed limit. And in almost all these instances, the posted speed limit is actually too fast for safety, right? So we have a speed limit that is too high and then people are exceeding that speed limit in, in over half in every single instance. In that kind of a situation, there, the deviant behavior is not speeding. The, the average behavior is speeding. Like the normal human being in that situation is actually speeding. And what that tells you is not that humans are all reckless and horrible and deviant and we should find them all or throw them in jail or take away their keys. What it tells you is that you've done something wrong here with the design of this roadway when you're getting the opposite outcome of what you want. You describe a school situation where we've gone and done all the things. I, I, I would use as my mind a metric where nine out of 10 cars are driving at a safe speed. When you have a situation where nine out of 10 cars are driving at a safe speed, the 10% that aren't are deviating from the norm. They are people who are overly aggressive. And those are instances and places where I think speed cameras and the awareness of speed cameras and the idea that I will get a speeding ticket if I drive too fast through this area can be successfully deployed and used in a way that will change behavior. Outside of that, you're in a situation where I do, let me be careful about my words here because I think people got really upset. I don't think that we will have the safety outcomes we want. We may change some behavior on the margins. I think it was questionable about how that behavior will change. You know, will people just avoid the cameras, go faster before and faster after? I think there's a lot of different ways people respond to speed cameras. But if you don't actually deal with the aggression in the environment that's been designed, um, speed cameras aren't 
that they're not going to get you to the outcome that you want. If the outcome you want is a safer place. Right. If the outcome you want is punishing drivers, I mean, yeah, speed cameras will get you that. But yeah. I, and, I don't find that to and, be very valuable. Punishing valuable. drivers is sort of what came came about uh, after you did your little survey. And I can't even remember the yeah. exact wording of the survey, but essentially it was like uh, you were sort of, sort of blown away by the willingness or that level of antipathy towards the, uh, the, the, the motorists and, uh, and the punitive enforcement thing sort of came out of like, okay, well, well, we've got to punish these people. And, and so John, I did yeah. two, I did two surveys. Yeah. I don't know if you saw, I, I might've missed one. Them. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. I, I, I'm sorry. Well, I, I don't have, I, I, I haven't, I might not have been able to follow everyone. <laughs> no, no, it's good. It, they came in, they came in subsequent. One yeah. was first and then the other one was second. Yeah. And the first one was basically like, what should we do to drivers? And it was, you know, or are, is this a reckless thing? It was getting at like, is this, you know, reckless behavior. And it was like three out of four people were like, kill this person. Like, you know, it was not, not that bad, but like it was, there was a percentage that was like, throw away the keys. Like, this is horrible. The second survey was when you are driving and you're in free flow conditions and you see a, a, a police officer on the side of the road, what do you do? What's the first thing that you do? And the answer was, you know, look at my speedometer, press the brake, nothing. And then, you know, like other. And it was like three out of four people said, I either look at the speed limit, I'm, the speed I'm going, or I press the brake. And when you look at these two surveys together, you have this huge number of people, and this is Twitter, right? But a huge number of people saying, if you are speeding at all, you are a reckless deviant who should be fined and, you know, have thrown away the key. And then three out of four people saying, if I see a cop on the side of the road, I either hit the brakes or look at my speedometer because I'm worried that I'm speeding. I, I, I found those two like answers completely incoherent because my guess is that all the people who said go after the speeder are also like, that's not me. And then in the next question, they're like, oh yeah, that's, that, that's me. <laughs> You know, there, there's this lack of recognition that it, here's where the lack of recognition is. I feel like the lack of recognition is that every time there is a fatal or traumatic crash, we take comfort in the idea that it was someone doing something reckless. Right. When the reality is it's someone doing something almost all times, it's someone doing something very normal who was unlucky. And the reality is, is that all of us, by the definition that we apply to that crash, all of us are reckless almost all the time. We're just lucky. And I, I think it's that luck difference that really gets, that really bothers me because we ascribe that, that difference in luck. And really it's, it's unluck because it's a one in 10,000 shot that you're gonna get in that crash the odds are always in your favor that when you act reckless, you don't get in a crash. It's the rare, it's the rarer instance, but it's like rolling a dice over and over and over. And every day it comes up poorly for some people and we label them as reckless. We find out the one or two things that, you know, you were going over the speed limit. You didn't do this. You didn't do that. When the reality is, is that happens millions and millions and millions of times every day by people who don't consider themselves reckless you know, but that behavior happens over and over and over again, because the system, in a sense, licenses it, forgives it, allows it to happen, says it's okay. Except if you're the one lucky one that comes up snake eyes on the roll of the dice. Yeah, 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 exactly. And the one part of your comment in, in reply in that when you're talking about the these punitive uh, damages and enforcement on that is we're not addressing the root cause. And so that's the whole point that we're, we're talking about here is, is we have to go upstream and figure out, okay, well, what's, what's the scenario? What's the setting? Oh yeah. Dumb. It's, it's, you know, it's putting up a, a warning sign, slow down on a strode through, you know, your, your, your grandmother's, you know, old neighborhood. It, it's like, yeah, yes. no, that, that doesn't work. Now you were no. just in the UK. Okay. I was. And, yeah. and, and we also had a little bit of a dust up, so to speak in the UK <laughs> that kind of came up uh, yeah. in, in terms of the prime minister and some of the things that he had said and really kind of framing this as this war on motorists and, yeah. you know, basically said, Hey, I'm, I'm going to roll back these slow street initiatives. I'm going to roll back the bike lanes. Um, this, there's no more, 
there's going to be no more of a war on cars. And so one of the things that, that, that I think is really important is understanding just how much this us versus them, uh, really harms our ability to stay focused on the root cause of changing our environment. Talk a little bit about uh, th- this uh, Twitter exchange uh, that happened uh, basically on the first day of, of October. Yeah. Nicholas is amazing. And that what I wrote there is a quote from his column, which was spot on. It was really good. So the prime minister of, uh, of, of the UK and of, of England, and I'm, I'm going to get his name wrong. Rishi, I, I, I read the economist every day and I'm, I, I pretty good on these things, but I, I always screw up on the names. I'm a horrible with names, John. He, as part of their, they had their basically conservative week. So we have our political conventions here every four years. They had their equivalent of that. And in their conservative week, he came out with a whole series of proposals that were basically embraced the idea that there's a war on cars and that he was on the opposite side of the people who uh, want safer streets. And, and and let's use, let's use his terminology. There's a war on cars. There's a war on modernity, on our culture, on who we are as people, on, com- on commuters, on suburbs. And I am on the side of those, those people. We should not be taking away their freedoms, their liberties. And I think if we don't, it, if we don't step back and recognize that by placing safe streets and by placing really block level human prosperity, by, by placing that in the context of a war on cars, a national campaign to, uh, you know, attack motorists or automobiles, if that's the route we go, we should never be surprised when national political parties pick up the opposite approach because the, the, especially in our uh, American system where everything's binary, right? There is a for and against, there's a conservative and a liberal, there's the yes and a no to everything. And the strategy of, of political power is to get 50% plus one. What you do is you create coalitions around these like big major issues. And if there's going to be a pro car party, there's going to be an anti car party. If there's going to be a pro bike lane party, there's going to be an anti bike lane party. The more we play that game, the more we allow our bottom up local block level, city level, neighborhood level conversations to be subsumed by these national political talking points, this kind of rhetoric, this kind of us versus them framing, the more it is going to empower the forces that are going to just reflexively oppose what you're doing. I always tell people, the the guy who drives the Hummer on the edge of town is of no material interest. Like the thing you should be doing is not to try to get him to get rid of his Hummer and ride a bike and move to the middle of the city. Like, like that's not, who cares? Like, just let him do that. What you want in that case is for that person to just completely ignore you and not want to fight you and not want to get in your way and not want to be a, and what you want to do is get to work on fixing your block and your neighborhood and your city. And that person will either adapt to that or not. But what you don't want to do is you don't want to give that person a platform at their level to oppose what you're doing, because then you're just going to empower a whole bunch of uh, reactionary, reflexive, non-thoughtful forces. And a lot of them, which are manipulating the process to, you know, like a lot of people who are anti-bike lane at the federal level or anti-safe streets at the federal level are not at their own community anti-safe streets. They are because it's like a winning political issue to be, I'm, I'm pro-liberty and freedom and car. I think that, let me say this, and I, I, I know I'm going to, I, I'm going to ask people listening to be a little bit generous with me because I, we work a lot as an organization about how we frame and discuss these issues. A lot of advocacy from the political left side tends to uh, default to large top-down initiatives and projects and campaigns. And, you know, I'm not going to suggest that that is always wrong, but I am going to say that when it comes to safe streets, 
you are fighting a huge, huge machine using their language and their tactics. And I don't think we'll make that much progress doing it. Look at the biggest win of the last two decades, which I would say would be complete streets. And we have documented over and over and over again how the engineering professions and the design professions and basically like automobile advocates have co-opted Complete Streets to build some of the worst environments in the country. Complete Streets, as it has come into effect, is essentially we're going to build an auto-dominated environment that will marginally accommodate people who are not in automobiles. And that's not a win in my framework, in my view, but it is a win in this top-down system, right? Because it marginally moves what is happening here. The energy around fixing streets and the places that are having the most momentum, uh, the most results, the most, I mean, we just interviewed someone yesterday at Strong Towns from Jersey City, New Jersey. And they're down to zero deaths in a city of almost 300,000. And they've done it almost exclusively through small bottom up block level action. And I think the shocking thing or the, the, the amazing thing is that by spending small amounts of money doing block level stuff, they've actually built this massive culture around biking and walking. And their biggest struggle right now is they can't keep up with the demand to fix their local streets. Right. Yeah. Yeah. And I'm and, and, and glad you brought that up as an example, because we do now have uh, an actual in the U.S. of A example in both Jersey City and also Hoboken. So two Hoboken, examples yeah. uh, of, of cities that are making dramatic progress on Vision Zero, which, again, for those not uh, familiar with the term Vision Zero, it's it's a program, an initiative, a way of thinking that basically doesn't accept that, you know, the 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 carnage that we have out on our streets is something that we should accept, that we should be able to get to zero fatalities on our streets and roads, uh, as well as reducing or eliminating the, the number of serious injur- injuries as well. And so that's that's something. Um, I'm going to shift gears just a little bit to, to get yeah, over to a couple of things that hit my radar screen. But w- one is we're going to shift gears to talking about October being Pedestrian Safety Awareness Month. And we'll, we'll talk a, a little bit about uh, some of that, but I do want to address some of the things that are popping up in the chat uh, right now. One of them was was asking when uh, Stefan was asking uh, when when you're going to be able to make it to the Netherlands. I, yeah, that's a good one. I want to know too. That I would love to have you uh, be there. Maybe we could uh, I could take you on a tour of some of my favorite cities there. I would love that. I would love that. I'm 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 always humbled when I get invited places. I was invited to the UK and I was able to go for a conference and then we set up a couple of speaking engagements and John, quite frankly, I didn't expect anybody to show up. Like what, what do I have to say to anyone in, in the UK? And we packed, you know, we, we packed some places and they were engaged, they were interested. And I'm like, wow, I, I can't, it, it seems so much better here. Like the, like the, the worst, the, the best parts of the U S are like the worst parts of the UK. And, but still there's a hunger for bottom up action. There's a hunger for people to, to do things, to make places better. I've been to the Netherlands and I've been blown away. I really feel like I have little to teach people there or to share with people there uh, that would be beneficial to them. That being said, I would probably be shocked by some of the conversations and maybe I, I could, I would love it if no, if only for my own Selfish enjoyment. I would love it. Yeah, yeah. So maybe we need to make it happen. Yeah, there you go. So uh, again, some of the things that that, that popped up uh, here in, in in this month of pedestrian safety awareness. Uh, one of them was uh, Pennsylvania DOT had put out uh, you know an entire scree of of pedestrian safety. And uh, I noticed this morning that it has been removed. They actually did remove their post uh, that they had put out there. And Beth Osborne, who you know quite well uh, with Trans- uh-huh. Transportation for America, kind of laid into them a little bit. And again, these awareness months uh, are, as she says, they're useless and even harmful. And we need to take time, you know, it's time for action. And, you know, she's talking about time for action that we need to start addressing what you were just talking about, which is we need to, you know, stop focusing on the atomization of people 
blaming individuals and trying yes. to change individual behavior, we need to start addressing two things, I think. From a strong towns perspective, a bottom-up revolution perspective, it's like funding some of these little things. And then the second thing I would say is we need to address the root cause further up the chain, up the stream, uh, that is these systems that are inherently built and subsidized that undermine anything that's happening locally. It, yes. I, I, I feel like it's important to understand the, the people running these campaigns um, because they're, they're so tone deaf and they're so horrible. I mean, they just, they are so bad. Um, well, I mean, and not the people are bad. The, the people are actually, they, no, the campaigns are the horrible. The campaigns are horrible. The campaigns are bad. Right. The people are actually thinking they're doing good things. They, yes. they're, it's coming from a good yes. part in their heart. I just want to clarify yeah. that. Thank you. It is coming from a good part in their heart. And that's why I feel like we need to understand them because what, what they have at their core is just a misunderstanding of what creates safety, right? There is a belief and it's backed up by reports and official data and stats and all this. There is a belief and it is a wrong, incorrect belief that driver, that crashes and particularly fatalities are caused primarily by driver error or by pedestrian error or bicyclist error. There's a, someone makes a mistake in the system. The, let's, let's, let's put a pin in that and just say, identify another branch of design of anything where we accept user mistake as like the problem, you know, like uh, b b baby sleeping, why uh, crib, uh, you know, we, we got to, my kids are now old, but I remember we got a crib. It was all this like, oh, you know, this safety thing and that safety thing. And oh, you got to throw your crib out because it's more than two years old and the safety things have been updated. If, 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 if five infants die in a year because, uh, you know, the thing didn't click quite right, we never say like, that's the mom's fault. We never say like, that's the dad's fault. Like they didn't do that. We say, we need to design a better crib so that humans who make mistakes don't make that mistake again. Right. Right. That's, that's what we do. Only in street design do we say, we need to, you know, screw this design. Like the design is what it is. It's the people who have screwed up here and they're the ones to blame. It, the analogy that I've started to use to explain this to people who are doing this kind of work is imagine that you were very concerned about public health and you recognize that we have an obesity problem in this country and we need to try to reduce that. We need to get people eating healthier. And so as part of an eating healthy campaign, let's say we just start around your office. What we do is we first go out and buy a bunch of donuts and cookies and salty snacks, and we fill the break room up with that stuff, and we make it freely available to everybody so you can consume. It's all there. And then we go to the bathroom, and on the back of the stall in the bathroom, we put a little sign that you know has an overweight person who's uh, in some tragic situation and say, don't end up like this, avoid salty snacks. What are people going to do? And I think we can all see clearly, like in a, you know, even if you have, even if you read the back of the stall and you're like, yes, I'm committed to eating healthy. And then you go sit down in the break room and now your stomach's crawling and you feel a little hungry and oh my gosh, that donut looks good. And everybody else is eating it. Pretty soon you're just a human responding to the environment around you and you're consuming donuts and salty snacks, regardless of what, whatever PSA you got in the bathroom. These public information campaigns are dumb, ineffective, insulting, and they come from an incorrect understanding of what motivates humans to change their behavior. I think that's like the main, like it, it comes from an incorrect understanding of what motivates a person to do something differently. And let, let me, let me put a button on this by saying, I think a lot of the people who would consume the donuts and the salty snacks would in a different moment in their life say, I'm going to avoid donuts and salty snacks, 
right? But then they get into that environment and the, the rational side, the thoughtful side of their brain slips away and the system one kind of, oh, that donut looks good. I can rationalize that. I'll work out tonight. I, I'll go, I'll eat less for dinner. You know, you start to like rationalize things in the moment because we are human. This is the same thing we do when we're driving. And when we don't understand that, we make all kinds of really dumb things like this ad, right? It just doesn't. I'm going to play this. Yeah. I, I, play so, it, play so, it. so literally this, this, this one this, is horrible. This one's really bad. And this one literally came out in the aftermath, uh, you know, in, in the, in the wake of the Pennsylvania DOT, uh, version of it, uh, this one came up from the, the Richmond RCMP. So, so for folks who haven't seen this yet, Hang on tight, because this is this is amazing. So in 41 seconds, uh, the, the, the RCMP, the Richmond RCMP, uh, managed to like kick the hornet's nest of, uh, of folks, you know, uh, say, yeah. WTF, what the heck are you doing? I'm going to play Tom Flood's remix to this just to, to. Oh, really? I haven't seen this. Oh, yeah. So, so, so Tom actually did a remix to this. And so, uh, this okay. is, this is a good one to see. <laughs> and of of course the the you know we choose not to to to, to his point there and it's not it, it's it's really we choose not to, it's not like we need to be shifting that blame over to the driver because that's kind of what the, the, the Richmond RCMP is doing anyways, is, is it's saying it's equal. It, we have equal responsibility. It's the fact that these are still atomization. These are still focusing on individual actions and not looking at the fact that we've designed a system that in the United States routinely kills, you know, 43,000 people a year and causes, you know, a million plus serious debilitating injuries. And we still are, you know, at that higher level, you know, because so much of who we are as a society and our economy is built upon this, this thing that we keep this thing rolling. And it's, and it's more than just cars and motability. I mean, this gets to the entire strong towns, uh, you know, Ponzi scheme of, you know, the experiment, the, what is the suburban experiment? So it's all interrelated, inter, in, interlaced, and the policies. Uh, it's not just as simple as saying, "Okay, let's let's pass a a, a a speed limit of twenty is plenty in our city." It's so much deeper and so much more insidious in terms of the challenges ahead. Right. Why did the driver in that video feel like it was okay to look at their phone? Yeah. And when you say, and you, when you mean, okay, literally you're saying stretching, you know, switching from that level, level one to level two or, or, or yeah. whatever that is. Yeah. yeah. System one and system two. System why why system did they two. feel? So l let's assume that the driver is not a psychopath. Let's assume that the driver actually cares about their fellow human beings. Let's assume that the driver does not, is not indifferent to whether they hit someone or something. And I feel like those are all safe assumptions for 99 plus percent of people. Why did a driver who's a normal human being feel like it was okay for them to look at their phone? And I think there's one answer that says, well, because they're, they're, 
they're a reckless person. They don't care. They're, they're not compassionate. They are selfish. They're, and uh, that, that, that leads you nowhere. That, that set of insight leads you nowhere because we can tell people, don't look at your phone. Don't look at your phone. Don't look at your phone. And people still look at their phone. I wrote an article called texting in your risk gap. To, to, to kind of get at that. Why do people look at their phone? And the reason they look at their phone is because we have designed the environment to signal to drivers, we've got your back. We've got all this covered. We've given you wide lanes. We've given you wide recovery zones. We've given you clear areas. We've given you lots of margin for error. And so as a human, you're sitting in this very, very safe environment, this environment that feels deceptively safe, right? It's not as safe as, as we make it feel to the driver, right? This is the knife sticking out of the thing, right? We have this illusion of safety that we have created. And because of that, the driver as a human feels comfortable doing other things with their brain than focusing on driving. And if we don't recognize as that as a human reaction to our design, we're, we're missing something very, very deep. Yeah. And uh, yeah. Martin this morning uh, posted this and saying no amount of, of pedestrian reflectors or awareness Amen. campaigns are going to, to help with this. This is safety hashtag safety theater. It's and, and, and to his point, the, the you know, the system has been designed and optimized for vehicle throughput. And this brings us back to, you know, the, the example in, in Massachusetts that was a, a running theme through your, your book, Confessions, of the fact that that's what they were prioritizing. They were prioritizing, you know, throughput of motor vehicles over the lives of people outside of, of motor vehicles. But also not to, to forget, too, that a very high number of people of those 43,000 lives lost each year are in the vehicles, too. So there is yes, that false absolutely. sense of security that it's safe to be driving at these uh, incredibly uh, dangerous and fatal speeds. Uh, so, I mean... <laughs> Because the carnage that you see when you see two two vehicles traveling at, say, a modest speed of like, you know, let's just pick a speed, 30, 35 miles per hour. Uh, yeah. If it's a head on collision, that's a collision of 70 miles per hour. I mean, it's it's the carnage is, is really, truly astounding. But anyways, I, I wanted to just kind of, you know, reemphasize this, but I also wanted to pull something out of this little quote that he had there, which was, and and this came up in the chat. Thank you very much, uh, folks. I am keeping an eye on on your running dialogue there. And the, the comment about oversized vehicles and the, the concern that we now have with the fact that we have SUV and pickup truck bloat. Now, you and I both grew up on ranches and farms. And so, yeah. you know, I had... I had access to two or three pickup trucks the entire, uh, my entire childhood uh, where I grew up. Yeah. But those were, those were actual tools. Farm of, vehicles. Of farm right. vehicles. It was, it was actually what we <laughs> yeah. were doing with them. Talk a little bit about this, that we have this rather interesting and challenging situation where you and I are talking about, hey, we need to build safe systems. We need to work on our design here. We need to change our built environment. But then at the same time, we've got like, you know, massive tanks rolling down our streets now. Yeah, Th there's a there's a cause effect here. And I feel like I, my hackles get up a little bit when people start focusing on the, the vehicle bloat. And again, try to tie it to like, this is a disordered personality trait that is doing this. And, and trust me, I... Uh, you know, my daughter is in high school. My youngest is still in high school and we could go six blocks over that way to the high school and the high school just tore down a huge, beautiful, historic building to expand their parking lot. And if we went to that parking lot, it would be full of big pickup trucks driven by students who don't work on farms and who don't haul things. And, you know, there, there there's, I, I do think that there is a cultural milieu that all this sits in that is in many ways uh, kind of messed up. But I think there's a cause effect here, right? We have made it very easy. We've, we've made our design standard, in a sense, the big Hummer. Or quite frankly, we've made the design standard a huge semi-tractor trailer to be able to drive through every neighborhood in the city. You know, the, the one time that you have the U-Haul pull up and load and unload the house 
every, you know, how many years. We want to make sure that that is easy and simple to do as opposed to like the one-off weird thing where traffic would have to get out of the way and all that. And so we over-engineer and over-design all of our streets for this stuff. And then we're somehow shocked when people utilize all that capacity with this like status symbol of a large vehicle. I'm insensitive to the complaints of people who say, when you narrow the street, it makes it harder for me to drive through. I'm, I'm insensitive to that because, and I think cities should largely be insensitive to that because quite frankly, if your suburban commuter can't drive quickly through your neighborhood, who, who gives a damn? Like, who cares? I, I, like, I don't care. But for some reason, cities get really, really sensitive to that critique. I feel like if we were less sensitive to that critique, what you would find is that a lot of these trucks would just like become passe. They would like, I can't drive this truck because I'm going into the city and I'm not going to be able to get around with this truck. So we're going to have to take the car or we're going to have to take some other vehicle because like I can't drive this big ass pickup truck through here. Yeah. Well, and if I can, ju- if I can jump in to uh, uh, Chuck to, to say something is that part of, of what makes the, those bigger vehicles more attractive is the fact that we have so subsidized making it possible and, and financially viable for that to happen. I mean, we, we have never paid the full price of our, you know, car brained lifestyle or motor normativity Uh to use, uh, um, Ian Walker's, uh, you know, actual term. And so, yeah, it's, it's not like, you know, you're, you're talking about, you know, the, the pain, the friction of being able to manute maneuver through a redesigned space. But we've also had a situation where we've been, you know, artificially depressing, you know, the price, the cost of being able to drive around, uh, you know, Abrams tanks in our neighborhoods. Yes. This is, so there's a whole group of people who I've worked on, you know, the subsidies that like, if you design your big pickup this way, it falls under this category and then you get like low, lower taxes. And if you, I, I don't understand all that and I don't get into it. And quite frankly, I don't care because it's again, top down stuff, but from a bottom up standpoint, I, you know, I, I walk around and I just look at these environments that are designed. John, I was in the army and in the army, I was a truck driver. I drove uh, a, a, a deuce and a half. I drove a, I drove a five ton. I drove big, huge trucks, right? In my city, someone has, and I, I don't even know how this occurs, but someone owns a deuce and a half, a two and a half ton, big army cargo truck, the kind that you would have troops in the back and all that yeah, and drives it around my neighborhood. I, 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 I look at this and we all laugh. Like, it's funny, like, ha ha, but he's driving like the truck I drove in the army. It's not designed for city streets, but it works just, there's no friction. <laughs> it's funny, not funny. He can drive it everywhere in my community with no friction because the streets are all designed to accommodate that truck. Yeah. And not just accommodate it like I can fit through, but accommodate it at speed, right? Like, like, and and that I think if we recognized, let me let me very strong towns this. If we recognized how much we in my neighborhood are spending on wider streets to accommodate that, versus how much we would how much less we would spend if we had streets that were sized not for the through traffic of commuters and other people, but just sized for people walking, people biking, and nice neighborhood speeds of travel. We would save dramatically on our costs and we'd have much better neighborhoods. Yeah. You know, how do we pivot from this us versus them narrative that is so pervasive to all of these discussions, whether it's specific to what we were talking about today in terms of road safety or whether it's even more broadly the the urbanism challenge that we have and the the strong towns challenge that we have? How, How do we get past this, you know, us versus them narrative? 
Uh, I, I think we we have to work at, at the neighborhood level. I mean, the, the, our, the bulk of our energies need to be spent in a bottom up way. I always tell people like, it's fine to be invested in politics and it's fine to care who the president is and it's fine to care what is passing Congress. But if that's taking up like more than a, a, a fraction of your time and you're spending like many multiples of that, of what you're spending on your city and your neighborhood and your place, I think you're going to find your life wasted in many ways. You know, you're going to find yourself looking back at your life going, well, I, I, I spent all this energy and I really affected nothing. When we work at the block level, a lot of these things melt away. And I think we start to see the nuances of people. We start to see that, you know, people of conservative mind are, are really valuable and people of progressive mind are really valuable. And working together, they actually accomplish a lot of stuff and not in a bipartisan way, not in a way where they have to sacrifice it for each other, but in a way where it's like, we need cities that have a certain amount of order and a certain amount of predictability and a certain amount of, of continuity. And we also need cities where people care passionately about those left behind and people care passionately about each other. And we're very sensitive to uh, the harms that are being done. And it's the merging of those things that actually make a beautiful place. So I, I, I think we pivot and we get past it when we stop allowing ourselves. I'm going to use a very strong word, but when we stop allowing ourselves to be pawns and hostages of the, the national talking points and the national dialogue. The national political parties have become really, really, really good at motivating people to get out to vote by keeping them in a state of frenzy, by keeping them in a state of uh, anger and hatred at the other, by tapping into that part of our brainstem that is almost fight or flight, you know, like that, that's not my group, that's the other group, therefore I'm going to fight them. And I think when we recognize that you know, the same techniques that are used to sell us cars and prescription drugs and, uh, you know, wh whatever other product you want on TV are the same techniques that are used to sell us a political ideology. We may like that car. We may value that prescription drug. We may identify with that political ideology, but that doesn't mean that we're beyond being kind of suckered and motivated and, you know, having our soul kind of shifted by it. I think when we recognize that, we can dial that part of us down and dial up the part of us that really cares about our neighbor, cares about our block, cares about our place, and finds uh, more productive things to do locally. Yeah. And when we do that, we make great progress, right? Yeah. And I, I pulled up the uh, on your website here the the community uh, movement page, local, con yeah. local conversations, and that's exactly yeah. what you're saying here. Is we need to start having these local conversations. And so uh, talk a little bit about this particular initiative and how you are uh, sort of formalizing and helping people along this way. Uh, the question here is, are you ready to lead? That might be intimidating to some people. Maybe they're not ready to lead, but they would be definitely ready to participate. Uh, talk a little bit about this, uh, the local conversations. So what I just said, I think to some people will sound very naive. Chuck, oh, you, you know, you, you, you've got a, a naive view of humanity that we should work bottom up. That's not how the systems work. That's not how things get done. I, th I think the opposite. I think that I've been too naive in the other direction. Mm -hmm. when, when this program was started, what we, what we noticed was that there were people around the country meeting in our name. They were calling themselves strong towns, you know, Sioux Falls, strong towns, Tulsa, strong towns, Dallas. And we didn't know who these groups were. And so we started to study them and we recognized that the best ones, the ones that were the most effective had a few things in common. They, they had more than one leader. They were meeting regularly and they were talking about strong town stuff and then going out and taking action. They were, they were influencing the local conversation in their community. And so we, we formalized this program and we kicked it off. And the idea was that we would try to get 25 of these by the end of the year. There's 186 of them, I think, at last count. We have over 900 requests to start new ones. 
the ones that are in place are not have two people or five people. There's ones with like dozens and dozens of people that are meeting regularly talking about strong towns ideas. And then I think even more importantly, talking about how they take the insights and the shared values and the shared things they're trying to accomplish and go do the next smallest thing. Like, how do we get some momentum around this? What is the next smallest thing? How do we do that? I've been blown away. And I think my naivete was that I thought this would be a process where we would have to convince people that this was a, a thing that they should do. And the reality is, is that there's so much hunger for meaningful things. That's how I'm going to describe it. A, a, a meaningful way to exercise your passion for society, your passion for civics and life in your community and your place. It's one thing to go on Twitter and bitch. It's another thing to, um, you know, go vote once every other year, every four years and get riled up. It's one thing to, you know, watch a cable news network of your choice and, and foam at the mouth. It's quite another thing to meet with people in your place and then go out and do something strategic to create a bottom-up revolution that's going to change your community. It's really empowering for people in a way that is obvious when I say it, but, uh, but I, I think I was underselling it even in my mind, how much passion there was for this. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, so Josh actually has a question for us and that is, uh, what books uh, should he be reading currently? I asked him if he had already read your two books. I haven't had an answer back yet. Uh, so I'm, uh, maybe I'm assuming that he has read uh, both of your books. Uh, Josh, if you haven't, that's my cue to endorse both books, The Strong Towns, Bottom Up Revolution, and also Confessions of a Recovering Engineer. Other than those two books, what what books are, you know, should Josh and anybody else in the audience be considering uh, right now, given the state of what our challenges are in front of us? Yeah. And it's Josh a, just popped in and said, yes, he sure did read read them both. Oh, well, thank yeah. you. It's a, it's a really good question. I may be the wrong person to ask because I'm an obsessive reader. You are. <laughs> so I do, I do like 50, 60, I do like a book a week. Yeah. So I do like 50, 60 books a year and I, I, I can't get enough. And can I, I do, jump in and say that usually each year you have like an entire list of, of books? Well, that's what I was going to say. I, I'm, yeah, I do about half on audiobook and half, uh, you know, reading every year I publish a list. If you just go best books of the year, strong towns, uh, on Google, you will get all my lists going back to, I think, 2013 or 2014. And then it always links to Pinterest, where I post every book that I read for the year. I do like a top five. So I, I, I also have to say, I don't read as a general rule, and this frustrates a lot of my friends and colleagues who do, do this kind of stuff, but I I don't read books about planning. I don't read books about transportation. I don't read books about, like, I'm just not, I don't, I'm always like looking for, like the best book I read this year, I was thinking, cause I've got, I'm going to start writing my, my end of the year piece. Uh, was a book about physics and I don't know. I, I'm, I, I kind of feel like all of this stuff is human based and system based and the kind of the broader palette of understanding you can have the, the, the better off you're going to be. So let me, let me answer it this way. I feel like if I had to give you like three let's say three critical books, anything by Nassim Taleb, but I would focus on The Black Swan or Anti-Fragile as being, th these are not easy reads. He needs an editor badly. He refuses to have one. You know, he, you will read a little bit and then take a long walk, but these are, these are really, really, it's really insightful books. Daniel Kahneman, Thinking Fast and Slow. I can summarize it for you in a tweet. You are a slightly evolved chimpanzee. That's the tweet. But the reality is, is that when you go through that book, at the beginning, you will believe you are a thoughtful, rational person. And at the end of it, you will recognize you're a slightly evolved chimpanzee, and so is everybody else. And we need to think about humans differently. And then I, I would say the original Green, which is funny because it's such a niche book. We are sending that out to all of our friends of Strong Towns. We have a, a, a group of donors uh, highly committed people that we have a book club with and we send them two books a year. And the one we're, we're sending them now is The Original Green. It's by Steve Mozan. It's never been on a bestseller list. It's never sold thousands of copies. But if you want to get 
like really practical insights on how to build places. This is a genius set of insights. It's a genius book. Yeah. I I love it and adore it. Yeah, yeah, no, you, and you I love and adore Steve. You, you brought you love and adore Steve, and so do I. So uh, I had a, a tweet from him uh, queued up and ready to go, and uh, <laughs> and and so I. I I just had to put this out there because I, I was sipping from my uh, Strong Towns National Gathering mug here. Oh, beautiful. And, thank you. <laughs> uh, uh, and thank you very much for uh, to the organization for sending that my way. I was able, they had the honor of serving on a, a panel there. Yeah, and you were to, great. And, and to Steve's point, uh, we had that opportunity for both of us uh, or for both organizations to, to, to co-locate uh, during this year's Congress for the New Urbanism and the Strong Towns National Gathering took place. And I want to echo what Steve Steve says here is that I was just so encouraged to see the new fresh energy and the young vibratism, you know, of their, I, I sat a, around a table of, I, I want to say they were all in their twenties and yeah. uh, they were just so stoked to be there, uh, to be engaging in all these discussions. Uh, my panel that I was in was standing room only. Um, we were uh, talking about social media and, and content creation. And uh, I was just blown away by the energy. Talk a little bit about that experience from your perspective. You and I didn't even get a, a chance to talk too much because you had a family obligation you had to get to. You couldn't even attend the, the Congress. No, I, I, my daughter, my oldest graduated from high school. And so I did the, I did that and then like flew out at some ungodly hour in the morning to get home for that. John, that was, it was beautiful. And I really was blown away. I, I have the good fortune to be able to travel around and speak to people a lot. I, I, I spend a lot of time on the road and I get to meet a lot of people and I've watched the enthusiasm of this movement grow and grow and grow from very, very modest roots, you know, back in the 2009, 2010 range to this insane thing now where we can just put out a flag and hundreds of people show up. The young people, I don't think Strong Towns is a young movement. I think that it is a kind of multi-age movement. We certainly had a lot of people of different ages. But when you look at an organization like CNU or you go to APA or you go to any of the kind of like established planning, city design, city building things, they tend to be OLD, right? They tend to be white guys who are older, who are doing professional things within silos and hierarchies with rules and standards, and they debate those things. The thing that I've always taken energy from, from our movement, and it was a little overwhelming for me in, in, in uh, Charlotte when we got together, was just how young and how enthusiastic the Strong Towns movement is. And that energy, I, I'm, I'm, I'm more and more convinced every day that the people in society that our current system blocks and we see this manifest in macro politics in, you know, a far right and a far left and a, a really destructive conversation. I step back and I look and I see a, a lot of, I mean, Donald Trump and Joe Biden are both like what, 80 year old people whose time in leadership has come and gone. I mean, I don't want to polarize people, but like it, it really is the time for a new generation of, of leadership. And that's not to disrespect the boomers and, and people of that age group, but there's a, what, what, what has happened in our system is that we've created a lot of things that serve this very large demographic of baby boomers that have been at the forefront of change now for decades. My generation, Gen X, is kind of this modest, like we got to figure out how to make our way through life. But this next generation of millennials has really been shut out in a large way of decision-making, of um, power, of being able to buy a home, of being able to, you know, do a lot of things. And, and I think that, that the next generation coming behind it is just like building up water behind this dam. And anytime you give an outlet for that creativity, that energy, that passion, that I'm going to use the word love to, to manifest, they show up in huge numbers and they're very passionate and they make a huge difference. I take a lot of energy from it and a lot of humility from it too, because these are people who have a lot to give. And I'm just, I'm very, I'm very grateful that we can help, we can help put that to work yeah. for, for, for them in their place. Yeah. So yeah, we're going to do it again this year. We're going to be in Cincy. 
Okay, we're going to um, do it again. Okay, cool. I, we haven't done like a formal announcement yet, yeah. but I'll announce it on. I think the last time I came on your deal, I made a formal announcement early too. But um, yeah, we're going to be. You, we'll we, be we, we get, you get in trouble whenever you're here with me, for sure. <laughs> I do. Um, so we'll be in Cincinnati, and we'll be getting the the band back together. The thing that I'm most nervous about this time around is that, you know, last time we had a size limit. And we came close to that, but didn't go over it. And I'm a little bit concerned um, this time because our our membership grows and grows and grows. I mean, we have a lot of, of we're going to cross 5,000 in the next member drive, which is, I'm, I'm nervous that, you know, we can only fit 800 or so people in a, in a, in a thing like this, that we're going to have more demand than that. That's my biggest fear right now. Yeah. All right. We'll I want to get uh, this up problems. here. Uh, yes, Ian, uh, you got those titles correct. Yeah. Black Swan, Antifragile, yeah, yeah, Thinking yeah. Fast and Slow, The Original Green by Stephen Muzon. Um, I would also throw into that mix uh, the same book that I recommended to you, uh, Dark PR from uh, Grant Ennis. He has been on the podcast. Uh, that's really for not really the community level, although he does talk about at the end of the book, he talks about community organizing and doing the same thing that you talk about is getting out, getting together with your neighbors and talking about that. But mostly that book is talking about the higher level systematic stuff and the systems that are in place that are kind of stacked against us uh, because of the the way that uh, organizations and even governments, uh, even professions like the engineering profession um, have a vested interest in keeping the status quo going. So I would definitely uh, recommend that book too. Yeah. We're all conservative resistant to change when we get into, <laughs> when it comes to, that, when we get yeah. into places of power. I mean, it's, it's, it's yeah. very true. Yeah. yeah. Chuck, uh, before we wrap up here, because I know you need to get, uh, you have a, a hard stop here. Any final comments that you would like to make that we didn't have the opportunity to, to chat about yet? I, I, it, it's, it's interesting because you and I have known each other for so long and I'm, I've always felt very grateful for your project and what you've been doing I feel like there's so many ties to what we're doing and this idea that an active life, an active lifestyle is not a niche thing or something that only people in spandex do or a recreational thing, but it's actually like a, it is, it is the normal default human existence. Yep. I think it's something that is so underappreciated. I, I hear uh, there's a there's a local group here that's trying to do active living. They're sponsored by the hospital and they're out doing stuff. And they tend to wind up with two things. Either one, they're going to do a big project somewhere that I think hardly moves the needle. Or two, they're out doing like, you know, get out and get moving campaigns. And I'm like, let's let's have walking lunch. Like, let's like, let, there's so many like th there's so many opportunities to live the kind of life that, that you talk about. And it's so core to what it means to actually live in a strong town and live prosperously in a strong town. So I'm, I'm just grateful for you. I'm grateful for what you do. And I tune in and I, I, I feel like I still continue to learn things from you and be challenged by you. And I have to say, and this is not in a put anything on you in a guilt way, but when I have a, a day or two where I eat poorly and don't get any exercise or when I'm like, ah, I'm not going to walk to work today, I'm going to drive. Then I'm like, oh, John would be disappointed in me. I'm going to get out. And I'm going to, I'm going to do this. You always need a buddy when you're pushing yourself. Right. And you're my, you're my sometimes virtual buddy. I know you don't hold me accountable, but um, I hold myself accountable to you sometimes in ways that you, yeah. you're not even aware of, John. Well, I appreciate you saying that. And, and I also appreciate when I hear back from the, the, the audience and uh, the community that we have built here at the Active Towns channel, when I hear from you that some of these positive stories that, that I try to share from around the globe, uh, you know, you gain some inspiration from that. And, you know, I, I'll never forget uh, several years ago when Michelle Erfurt, you know, uh, you know, you know, reached out to me and said, hey, you really inspired me to start walking 
walking more in our neighborhood with our kids. And of course, now, you know, Michelle and, and Edward both uh, work for Strong Towns and is part of the family. Uh, but yeah, that's that's part of what I do. I've been passionate about doing this for the, the past 33 years. And uh, and I just I, I really cherish our friendship and this ability to, uh, you know, keep strong towns and active towns close together. As we talked about in our last live stream, you can't have one without the other. I agree. Agreed. Well, you you came to my city and you biked it and you said to me, Chuck, this is a very bikeable city. And I remember at the time I was really frustrated because I wasn't living in town yet. I was living way out and my, my, my last mile was in the city and everything else was horrible. And I moved to town and I bike a lot and I'm like, John is totally right. And I didn't see it until I was here and looking at it through your eyes. It was a very bikeable city. And now really you bike. walk to work and you bike oh, yeah. around. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. absolutely. No, I, I, my car will sit and not be used when I'm, when I'm home. Yeah. I drive to the airport and back. That's and right. that's pretty right. much it. Now. That's right. Well, we need to bring this to a close. Hey, thank you all so very much for, for tuning in. And I really uh, cherish uh, the conversation that has been uh, streaming in. Uh, Chuck, you'll have to go back and look at some of the comments that are in there. It's very, oh, very entertaining yes. and fantastic. Cool. Uh, and Chuck, thank you so much for all that you do with Strong Towns. I really appreciate you coming on again. Hey, thank you. Thank you. And likewise, I'm, uh, I'm, I'm glad we're good friends. Fantastic. And folks, uh, please, if you have enjoyed this, please remember to hit that like button. And if you haven't done so already, please be sure to subscribe to the channel. Just click on the subscription button down below. Ring that notifications bell so that you get notified when we've got new content. And until next time, this is John signing off by wishing you much activity, health, and happiness. Cheers. Yay. Cheers. <laughs> And again, sending a huge thank you out to all my Active Towns ambassadors supporting the channel on Patreon, Buy Me A Coffee, YouTube Super Thanks, as well as making contributions to the nonprofit and purchasing things from the Active Towns store. Every little bit adds up and it's much appreciated. Thank you all so much.